بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولله على الناس حج البيت من استطاع إليه سبيلا ومن كفر فإن الله غني عن العالمين صدق الله العظيم as inshallah, there are people who are going for Hajj, and today we want to talk about that method of doing Hajj. But with that, I would just like to give you some practical information also that we may need it anywhere between leaving and up to the time of coming back. Initially, my plan was to go into the details of all the things that we will be doing over there, which means visiting the Medina Munawwara, and then mainly the adab of the place, how to have the proper respect, and how to make a good use of Makkah Mukarramah, our time in Makkah Mukarramah, our stay in Makkah Mukarramah, being in the Haram, being around the Kaabatullah, then being in Medina Munawwara, a place where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is buried. So much that we have over there, if we look at it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose that place for having the greatest person that ever came to existence to be for him and his residence. He was born in Makkah Mukarramah. He lived a long life in Makkah Mukarramah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him to Medina Munawwara, and he chose Medina Munawwara for the spread of Islam. And then he chose Medina Munawwara to be the place where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would be at rest till the day of judgment. And we all know that the greatest portion of the earth is the place where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is. There can be nothing better than that place and nothing more important than that place. Everything that has any importance if Medina has any importance, if the Haram has any importance, if we have any importance as Muslims, it's all because of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we got it through Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, those will be some interesting details, but the weather doesn't allow us to go into all of these those details at this time, but inshallah, during the journey, as many of us together, inshallah, we will go through those things. The reason I mention it so that it will be in our mind that that's something that we really need to keep in mind, we need to learn, and at least, even if we don't learn it in detail, we have to keep these things in mind that Adab is the most important part of this trip. Because if we make a mistake in Hajj, what would happen? You may have to pay Adam, which means slaughter an animal for that mistake. Mostly mistakes are the type of, uh, of mistakes, people make the type of mistakes where you don't have to do nothing or you will have to pay them. Or the maximum, maximum to it will be that if a person really ruined the Hajj in such a way, which is very rare situation, the maximum to it will be that go back another time and make another Hajj. But disrespect to those places, anything that is done wrong in those places, there is no way that we can make up for it. No matter what we spend, no matter how many times we go back, no matter what we slaughter. There is nothing can make it for those mistakes that people make in disrespecting those places and dishonoring these great places that we have and uh, dishonoring this great favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of allowing us to visit that great land and great place and perform this great ibadah of our life. Hajj is the ibadah of a life. It's fard only once in a lifetime. Salah, every day. Zakah and fasting, once in a year. But, when it comes to hajj, it's once in a life. So, it's a ibadah of a lifetime. Of course, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, that a person who can afford to come to me, and still he doesn't come visit me every five years, that person is really in a very polite way, we may say, we may say that that person is very unfortunate who can afford to see me every five years and still he doesn't come to see me. 
So of course, the more we perform of these ibadahs, the better it is. But it's ibadah when we are performing that fard, fard will be performed only once in a life. It won't be done again. If we do it next time, it will be nafil ibadah. It won't be fard hajj. That is already done then. So other part of it is the most important part of this journey. Other respect, making proper use of the time, making proper use of this uh, special gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is through invitation. Really, it's not just through virtues. And Allah doesn't just choose, subhanAllah, it's not like us, that for who should I invite in this wedding? So we will choose this, this, this person. How about that person? No, he didn't invite us at that time, so we won't invite, we won't invite him now. How about the other person? No, you know, they, they don't like us so much, so not, not these people. SubhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses, and He just chooses out of His rahmah, we can say. That there is not that if we are going, we are the greatest people in the world, and we were the person, people that we really sure were supposed to be chosen for whatever we have done. If we look at that, we will be we will maybe last in the list, or we will just put in the list of those who, will, who are not welcomed over there. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rahmah, that is still He chooses us, is still He allows us to come over there, and still He invites us. So it's really, we need to be very thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for choosing us to invite us to His house and to go and visit that great place. Anyway, if I continue, then we'll just be going on on this topic. I have to stop here and just change it to things that we are very important because time is uh, very important this time and uh, we don't want to delay too much. First thing I would like to give you a list of things that you would need for this journey. Number one, make sure that you keep a copy of every document that you take with you. Whether it's passport, ticket or a check that is that you have sent to the embassy and they will return it. Have you received the passport yet? No. no. Okay. So the check, it will be, the check will be inside that passport. Uh, keep the copy of the check, of the passport, of your ticket, or any other dec- documents that you are taking with you. Try to, not to take the things that you don't need, but anything that you think you will need and you are taking it with you. Spend a little uh, extra few seconds to make that copy also. Many times it's very helpful, especially in a situation when a person loses something over there and you don't have any, uh, any copy of it, uh, you don't know how to deal with that situation, then it will be very easy that you have a copy back home. You can call any time for it to be faxed or to get some numbers from it, anything of that kind. So it's very helpful to keep copies of every document that you're taking with you. Number two, when you receive the ticket... A week or so before the travel, make sure that you reconfirm your seats. Regardless of who the travel agents are, if there are people going in different groups, regardless of who the travel agents are, it's nothing in their control in these days. Because every flight that goes for Hajj is full. (coughs) Every flight is full. You won't have a single flight going in this season with even one empty seat. It won't happen. So every flight is full and sometimes they are overbooked. And it's nothing that any person can do. Travel agent won't do nothing. We go to the airport, they won't be able to do anything because if it's overbooked, it's overbooked five more people. Simply means these five people are not going no matter what we do. Five people will be left behind. So... We have to make sure that we reconfirm our seats. It's not a normal situation here. We are talking about a very specific situation where, I mean, imagine that every day, for example, there are some days now, and as it will get closer to the Hajj, it will even get more and more, that each country, some of the countries, uh, each country is sending 80 aeroplanes per day. Some of them are sending 50 aeroplanes per day. So it's continuous continuous and uh, uh, with all of these uh, the situation a little delay in one flight you can imagine what it would do to other flights that is that are supposed to follow this flight so everything starts getting delayed and then if there are in within that time if there are five flights are supposed to arrive say within those few minutes 
and one of them is delayed. Now, in the next few minutes, they have five that are booked for that minute, for those few minutes. So now, where are they going to fit this late flight? So, and they have no control over it, where if the flight gets late from where it's coming from, the, the destination have no control over the situation. So it really, it's something totally different situation that we normally think of. Imagine about 2.5 to 3 million people are going to be gathering over there. And you can have little understanding of it once we arrive over there and you see, and those who have seen it, you know, remember that uh, if you leave your room at the time of Adhan, you won't get a place inside the Haram. Now, the Haram of Makkah can fit 2 million people. That's the size of the Haram. It can accommodate 2 million people. And imagine every Salah you have people performing Salah all around the Haram, outside on the roads, up to their hotels, inside hotels following the Haram, because stuff are getting all the way up to their rooms. So, that tells us the number of people that are there, and uh, the crowd of people that we are trying to get into. So, we have to be ready for these situations. The reason I'm mentioning this is that we realize it's a very unique and a very special situation. And Alhamdulillah, as long as we are under control, then everything will be under control. But if we are out of control, then nothing will remain under control. So we have to, mainly we have to control ourselves. Anyway, reconfirm your, your tickets. Number three, when you reconfirm your ticket, make sure that you order food also. If anyone has some extra papers or fine pages there, yeah, take those flyers because uh, those are about Hajj. So anyone wants to make notes or anything, you can write. And when you order it, they will ask you what type of food would you like to order. Please, don't order halal or Muslim food, order vegetarian food. Because they all will have their own definition of halal. We are going on different airlines and... They are having many different fatawas. It's a very special trip of Hajj. You don't want to eat something that we don't want uh, to eat during this journey and make just uh, lose all the ibadah during this journey. We know that just one mouthful of haram, 40 days of ibadah is gone. So we have to be very careful of what we eat during this journey. So order vegetarian food. Number four. Keep some extra pictures of yours with you, in case they are needed at any time, you have some extra pictures. If you have grown up since you took the pictures of your passport, which means if you, grow your, you have grown your beard or something, and the picture in the passport looks different than how you look at this time, then get an extra picture of recent picture, put it at the last cover of the passport inside and staple it with it. Because what happens is, whoever the group leader is, he will be called by the government, you won't, we won't get our passport, the government will keep it. He will be called by the government to recognize our passports. So, and he's in hurry, he has to recognize a lot of passport, he has a lot of work to do, so he's going to look at the picture. And he looks at the picture and says, no, no, I don't have this person with me. So, if that picture, the recent picture is there at the end of the passport, then at least he can see that one and say, okay, I, yeah, this person is with me. Because people with the same name and three million people, you expect that there will be more than ourselves over there. Keep the money that you take with you, keep cash money with you. Don't take travels and travelers check. Yeah, you can, you can keep some if you like, but the main money that you want to keep for use is cash money. And even in that, try to keep $100 bills, the newer bills, big face. The newer bill, the reason for this is you get a, you get a better value for it in exchange, you get better exchange for rate for those, then you get for the older ones, and then you get for, especially if you have 20s, you will have much lower rate, and if you have 5s and any other change, forget it. So, many of them, they won't even take those smaller bills. So, you need to keep $100 bills, 
and uh, newer ones will be better. Travelers check our useful some time in a special occasions, but remember, we won't have our passport with us. And they require you go to the bank, they tell you to give me your ID, uh, some wallet ID, and you don't have nothing with you, uh, a wallet ID. So it will be uh, difficult. Can we take our driver license? Take it. Uh, I don't know if they will read it. So you don't want to depend on that. It will be also good to keep a belt for a haram with something that has a pocket in it. My experience shows me that this is one of the best things I have found. This is for men only. Because that ihram will be for men only. So, it fits, it clips in, and holds your ihram, and at the same time, you have a lot of pockets in it, can keep your staff uh, important things in it. Similar ones they have to hold cameras and things like that. Okay, when we go from here, Try to keep at least one pair of clothing in your carry-ons. In case you arrive over there and your suitcase is missing. So the first thing is a person needs some clothing. You need to change your clothes after that long trip. So it will be a good idea to keep at least one pair of clothing with you uh, in your carry-on. Then keep a bag with you. This is not too good of a size. Last time they were taking from Frankfurt, from the transit, they were taking all of these bags and then just checking them in over there. They allowed it from here, but then, you know, we stop somewhere in the way, and then many times they take these type of bags. It will be better to have a little smaller than this one here, smaller than these ones. So this is a little bigger than what they normally like to see. The carry-on cannot be more than 10 kilos, otherwise they will take, they will take it away. For those especially who are going to Mecca first, we from here that we are going together, we are going to Medina first, so this is not for us. But for those people who are going to Mecca first, you will be having your ihram in your carry-on. And it's very important that you keep that carry-on within the specifications, which means not overweight, not more than 10 kilos, and not too big of a size, because if they take it away from you, you don't have no ihram, until you get to Jiddah at least. So after Jeddah you have no ihram and you want to wear the ihram before Jeddah. You get stuck there. There is a solution, but I won't tell you that at this time. Mainly is you have to take care of this part of it. But if anyone is not going to Makkah first, going to Medina first, and then, then we don't have to worry about ihram at this time. Things to keep with us, ihram, a sleeping bag, Try to keep a smaller size of a sleeping bag. There are many different sizes. I, this is why I brought one as a sample. It's very easy to carry because you will be carrying it more than you sleep in it. That's for sure. So it's better to have something small, although it may not be as comfortable as that bigger ones, but this is, I think it's more important that it's comfortable when we are carrying it and walking with it those long distances and we are walking miles, those of us who are not even used to walk uh, from our house to the car. For men, you want to keep special slippers for a haram and a small pillow. Now, beside the pillow, as far as a haram, slippers and sleeping bag. In case you don't find the right thing here in your door, you decided you don't want to take it from here, you may take it from Medina, it's cheaper, and you can very easily find it over there. So it's available over there, and it's very easy to find it there. Then, very important, keep food for your journey. This is when you, inshallah, with me, you'll, this is one thing that you will always hear, and this is what you will learn, that make sure they have proper food, and keep enough food, because I'm with you too. <laughs> you carry what, what kind of food? Whatever you can feed me, just take it. <laughs> Cook food from here. Uh, try to take sandwiches. Things that, because remember, the journey is long. Just journey itself without long break in between. Normal break, I'm talking, it will be around 24 hours before we get somewhere where you can get regular food. 
in the plane, inshallah, you will get it. But say, if they tell you, oh, we didn't get your order, now what? So, keep some food with you. Uh, dry food will be good. Well, it's always best that you keep some dry food with you, uh, like uh, some dry sandwiches uh, of whatever you like, and uh, cookies, and uh, snake bars. Yes, uh, whatever you take, I'm there. And this is now true, that when you keep it, remember that you are flying with people that are all your brothers and sisters. And if you are eating and your brother next to you is not having food, you are going to share it with him for sure. So, just I'm telling you so that you keep that in mind when you're taking anything or when you're eating anything over there. And here, we, subhanAllah, there, in this part of the world, when initially when we came, it was something I couldn't believe. Someone is eating, you go somewhere, a person is eating apple, and everyone is looking and he's talking to everyone, and he doesn't offer you. I have never seen it in my life. When you give everything that you have and you try to give more, but here you eat and uh, it's very normal, but this is how it is. In that trip you can do this. Now, try to keep some chocolate bars, snake bars, some special ones. I think there are some good uh, ones that if you eat it, at least you have something in your stomach. You feel that you ate something. It's not just a, uh, for refreshment. It's not just a chocolate. It's something that can feed you also. Try to keep some extra of those because what happens is in Mina sometime when you're walking long distances, you may need those. Then especially in Arafat and in Muzdalifah. Remember in Arab we will be leaving between the time that we leave Arafat and get back to Mina. That will be around 24 hours or a little more and it's difficult to find food in that, during that period. So this will be one of the good things to have uh, for sisters in their purses and for men in their carry-ons, whatever they have, uh, to keep it with them. Also, keep two small locks with you for the baggage once you arrive over there. So in your hotel, when you have the uh, room and you keep your baggage over there, keep some uh, small locks with you so you will use them over there. You will not be able to lock your baggage from here. If you lock your baggage, they are going to either rip your bag Break it or break the lock. One of the, whichever they find easy, they will do it. It's not allowed to lock the baggage, uh, as the check-in baggages that we are putting it in the plane. So you keep it with you. We will be, you will be using it once you get over there. Because it's a trip of ibadah. Now these are the things that, of course, we normally need. So I just uh, thought it will be useful to mention these things, and we will need these things, uh, inshallah, because we are going for our ibadah. Try to keep a tasbih with you. It will remind you always to keep your tongue busy in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep your Qur'an, a small Qur'an with you. So whenever you want to read Qur'an, you have it because you won't find Qur'ans in Mina and Arafat, those places. It's not that easy to find Qur'ans over there. And you want to read Qur'an for sure. So try to keep your own small copy of a Qur'an with you. Reading glasses if you need those. And keep a book of dua. Also, keep some warm clothing with you, like a sweater or something, because it will be cold in Medina, and it will be cold in Muzdalifa for sure. Especially these two places, it will be cold. So, you want to keep a sweater and a pair of socks. Just the, these two things should be enough, inshallah. You don't need to take a whole bunch of them. One of each should be enough, because it won't be too many days for us to wear those. But in Medina, Munawara normally... When it gets cold, it is cold, so uh, we need it. And these, uh, we are going in a season that will be cold over there. So we will need it there, and uh, it will be helpful in Muzdalifa only for sisters, not for men. Now for sisters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it easy. No clothing for ihram that are required. The thing that is required is covering the body properly. The thing that I have to mention is uh, for especially those that are not used to covering the head properly, try to keep a type of a scarf that you can tight on your head. Because a lot of time what happens is trying to fix it from, from the side of the ear to this side and from the other side and by just time trying to fix it, it just keeps on moving back and forth. 
and especially when people sleep in the aeroplane. They are in a haram and it gets open and it gets visible and that is not good, especially in the state of a haram. So it's not allowed at all. Therefore, it's better to use a type of scarf that you can tie it. So even if you go to sleep while you're sitting in the uh, plane, it will at least uh, uh, the hairs are covered and you are not uh, getting into something that is not allowed. As far as clothing is concerned, normal clothing, including shoes. You can wear socks all the time. You can wear normal shoes all the time. So don't try to take the slippers uh, for you, except if you're used to wearing those. Uh, other than uh, beside that, I mean, there is no reason for you to take those. Yes, try from there, inshallah, you can take a pair of slippers for Mina and Arafat. The reason for that is, just keep it in your bag. Use it for the few days in Mina, Arafat and Muzdalifah because going to the bathroom, you don't want to use your regular shoes, they will get wet. So just for the use of those days, and in fact, you may even just keep it over there at that point where you use it only for using the bathroom and making wudu, and the rest of the walking, you do it in your normal shoes. This is for sisters only. For men, we, will wear, we have to wear those slippers, but for sisters, they can wear socks, any type of shoes, whatever they feel comfortable walking in, and any type of clothing as long as they are covering it properly. So all of that is allowed. There is no specific, specific type of clothing that need to be worn in haram, uh, as part of haram. And for brothers also, you need to take some good pair of shoes that normally you're comfortable walking in, like sneakers or anything that you're comfortable walking in, because the haram will be on only for some days. Beside those days, you will have to do a lot of walking. And in that, during that walking, you'll, no need for you to keep slippers, because we are not, normally we are not used to those slippers. They get off, uh, uh, someone can step on it, and they will be out. So uh, t you take some type of pair of shoes that you're comfortable walking in. And uh, uh, that, is, that would be for wearing it after haram. Sisters, please, and uh, these days I think I have to say brothers also, uh, make sure that you don't take any jewelry with you. Because there is no time to wear it. And we will be looking for a place to save it at all time. Oh, woman, you put it in the hotel, now you're in Mina, you're worried about it. Oh, what am I going to do now? Some, what if someone will get in it? I forgot it there. Oh, I was making wudu and left it there. So, it's, it's the best not to take any of those valuables with you at that time. With this, and before I tell you the complete method of performing the Hajj, few reminders. Once we are there, of course, with three million people, we can imagine it won't be very clean, especially when we go to the bathroom. And the reason is that when I use it, I didn't clean it. So when you go, you won't find it clean. And then the person goes after you, he will be cursing at both of us. So, it happens and it's only us. I can say it's only me and you. I mean, whoever, whoever else is, it's, it's all us. So, one of the people will make a little mess and the second person goes and makes a little more and then that keeps on adding on and so many people are using it. Don't say anything about it. Whatever we find, alhamdulillah, facilities are there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless those who are working hard to allow, have those facilities available to us. I remember, even the, I'm not talking, the reason I'm saying I remember that I'm not talking about 100 years ago, when we used to live there and we used to go for height, there were no bathrooms in Mina Arafat. No bathrooms in Mina and Arafat. So in Mina and Arafat, both of these places, uh, you have to go out in the jungle in those days. And nowadays, mashallah, even showers are there. There is so much water. People had to, in those days, you take a container of water, that's all the water you are going to have over there. Now, alhamdulillah, there is so much water. All the facilities are there. Of course, if we make mess, uh, it will be messy. Uh, of course, better than this will be that we clean it. We clean it. That's the best place where we can humble ourselves and do anything that any human being can do for his guest or do it at his home or do it anywhere in the world. Do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that place. That's the best place to do any type of work that is need to be done. But of course, we don't want to be just running after these things. But whatever we see, whatever we can do, that will be the best thing for us to do. Let's do it clean it and be quiet about it, that alhamdulillah, the next person that will use it will make some dua, will be happy, at least he's happy that, oh, I found the bathroom that was very clean, and we are getting the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
in buses over there, people try to rush to get to the bus. So please be careful, make sure you sit in the right bus. You sit in a wrong bus, that's it. You're going to a different place, different location, you get stuck on your way, there are so many checkpoints that will ask you, oh, do you belong to this place? And, no, I don't belong to this bus, okay, come out. And now just stay over here until we find out where do you belong to. So please uh, make sure that you sit in the right buses. Many t- I mean, not many people make that mistake, but very few that make it, I really, when I have seen a couple of those situations, I mean, you cry when you see the situation of that person, that there is no way that you can help that person anymore. And many times, I, this time I saw a person, Nigerian woman, she sat on a wrong bus, she ended up being in a wrong place, and now she doesn't know anyone's language and no one knows her language. So please be very careful about that. Also, always stay with your group. Always stay with your group. Don't try to, oh, my, my friend is in another group, so let me go and meet him or her. And you go over there, and now you don't know how to come back, or you lost, or the, your group, group have left before you came back. And it really creates a lot of difficulties and hardship for everyone if a person gets away from his or her group. Over there, you will find a lot of people that are not in a good health situation. I mean, they need help. Handicapped people, well, subhanAllah, just uh, as I remember, I may share it with you, some people that were with me, I think we saw it together, in Medina Munawar, we were in a hotel, and at, just at the checking of the hotel, and we saw someone came with a wheelchair, and the only thing that you could see of the person that's on the wheelchair is his head. SubhanAllah, it was such an amazing situation. Amazing how that man was. I mean, all you can see, it's only head. There was nothing else, and just this small part of the stomach and thing that was there is so small and tiny, that as if it is nothing is there. But that person is he's there for Hajj. As I said, invitation. So, there will be a lot of those type of people. Then people with young children, elderly people, try to help people. And always... Try to accommodate people in whichever way possible. Do more for people than we do it for ourselves. People like to rush to get a seat. And subhanAllah, as the bus comes, everyone rushes to get a seat. And when the bus stops, everyone runs to leave that seat. This is how fast the seats change. You know, this is how it tells us, this is our dunya. This is how fast positions are changing in the dunya. You run to position, then you run out of that position. So people run for those seats and then run away from those seats all of a sudden. So try to give that uh, opportunity to others. Okay, someone else needs this, go and sit in my place. Okay, I'll stand up for you. And these type of situations where you will be helping each other, very important point to remember. Anyone, when you go to haram, many times we say to ourselves, oh, okay, um, I know, I have to come back. This, uh, this is my hotel, I'll come back. And it's just in front of the door, so I remember it. And... We walk inside, now you go and do the tawaf, and after tawaf you want to go back home and you start looking around and all doors look alike. So now which, which of this door, these doors that you came from? And where is your hotel? When you, okay, you remember it was that direction, but now there are three doors in that direction that look similar. I don't know which one was mine. And you leave out of a, separate, a different door, by the time you go and come back it will be the second day. Uh, it's not that much, but it will be big with all of that crowd. Imagine if, I mean, if uh, the place can accommodate two million people and it's crowded, it's overcrowded and people are standing outside. So imagine the crowd and then how much you will have to walk to get from one side to the other side and one place to other place. So when we enter, when the first time you go over there, remember the number and the name of the door. Every door has a number on it. Remember the name and the number of that door. And now, when you go to the tawaf, place of the tawaf, to the mataf by the Kaaba, remember the direction of your door in a position of the black stone. So, because you will always know where the black stone is on the Kaaba. So you can say, okay, black stone is on this place. And from this corner, my door, the door that I came from, is on this direction. 
So initially what you will do is after you finish all of your programs, you will walk towards that direction and then you will start looking for the number of the door. It's not that difficult, but if we don't remember it, then it becomes very difficult. But if you remember just that n the number of the door, it becomes very easy. And initially, once you get used to it, you will just know exactly where your door is. Also, many times we go together, like two, three people go together, especially husband and wife, they go together. Always keep an understanding over there in case. That's for the haram, both Makkah and Medina. Or in the marketplace, you go for shopping or something, any of those situations. In case, if we get lost, we get separated from each other, there is no way that we can find each other at this place anymore. There is no way to look for each other over there. You'll think, okay, I'm going to just stand over here and wait, and the other person is only standing a few steps away from you, but you can see each other. Have that understanding, in case we are separated from each other over here, we will meet back at the hotel. I won't come back until after the Salah. So if, if we are separated, don't worry about me. I will just make it back to the hotel, but I will come back after Salat al-Isha, for example, and that's Asr time. So the other person doesn't get worried, and he, he or she keep on doing their own ibadah. Okay, we will just go back and meet at the hotel, because we both know how to get there. Otherwise, we spend a lot of time, or we will be wasting a lot of time, just looking for each other, and for no reason. Now, let me just quickly go over what we need to do from, starting from here until we perform the Hajj. Number one, and as I said, again, I will be just going quick over it. Uh, inshallah, more details, we will learn them as we go along and as you go during it, uh, for the journey, inshallah. Number one, if you have any rights of people, try to fulfill those. Especially people that we don't get along with, people that we don't like. Try to at least make a phone call, okay brother, okay my sister, I'm going for Hajj, Salaam Alaikum, and please forgive me for anything wrong that I have done. Just this much. So at least the hearts are clean, that situation of not talking to each other, of being upset with each other, and uh, those type of things are all out, because... When a person performs hajj, comes back clean from sins. But of course, the rights of people are not forgiven. So, if we go with those, we are going to come back with those. They are not going to be forgiven. So therefore, we have to make proper arrangement, make sure that we pay people's rights, whatever need to be paid, you uh, took someone's money, you used someone's things without permission, whatever else, whatever need to be paid, we have to pay. Whatever needs forgiveness for it, ask them for forgiveness. So inshallah, we go with clean hearts and carrying no hard feelings towards any person. Number two, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. So as we go over there, we are clean and we are ready to receive the rahmah and the rahmah and the barakahs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, have a very sincere intention of just fulfilling ibadah, nothing okay, I will be buying this and I will be going for this. Yeah, you might buy, I'm not saying don't buy nothing. But going with that intention that okay, we want to do buy this and it will be very good, I will bring the other person brought these gifts and now I will bring these gifts. Forget about all of that. It's, it's gonna, just that intention is going to ruin the whole ibadah and all the hardship that you're going through. So, don't have that intention. If you find things, inshallah, you will buy them. Yeah. You will find all the things. So, but don't have that as part of your intention. The intention is, I'm just going for Hajj, coming back from Hajj. I'm not worried about bringing no gifts or nothing for people and, uh, for, for, during this trip. Number two, I'm not looking forward for people to call me Haji Sab. That oh, mashallah, he's a haji too. Subhanallah, you know, no one say he's a namazi, he's, he performs salah and he's a musalli. And here haji becomes a big title. So, it's not, don't worry about becoming haji. The worry is that when I say, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, I'm going only to please Allah, I'm only answering Allah's call, no one else's call, and I'm not looking for any other worldly benefits out of it, regardless if it is name or fame or gifts or any other thing that I may get from there. Then, from now on, start thinking how I'm going to bring that change into my life. I'm going for that Allah has invited me, really accepted me. It's nothing, it's not our money, we had it for a long time. And there are people who have more than us. If it was because of that, they would go and we won't. And there, you will find people who have no money and they end up being over there for hajj. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is blessing that He invited us. So, let's think if Allah has really favored me with all of that, how can I bring that chain into my life that now my life will be totally around the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and I will be now in the rest of my life doing what I'm required to do as a follower of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When you are ready to leave home, cut the extra hairs of your body, trim your nails, uh, clean your body properly, because now you are going for a very special trip, and then on your way you may not be able to take care of these things. Perform two rak'ah salah nafil, and make a lot of dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept the journey, and to protect you against everything that is not allowed during this journey. One very important reminder, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he talked about hajj, one of the very specific things he have mentioned in Quran about it is wala jidala fil hajj, don't argue in hajj. And subhanallah it's a situation where many people end up losing their hajj just because of this point here. Because this is one of the things that is forbidden, in normal situation is forbidden. But when it comes to hajj, it's even worse and it will ruin all the reward of your hajj. So, wala jidala fil hajj, this is in Quran, that don't argue in hajj. And it will happen. Oh, this was my place here. How come you came and said, people, you people don't even learn anything. And especially, especially for some reason, people who go from these pad of land, where we think really, some, something is telling us we are very educated, and there are people who are coming from third world countries, they are very uneducated. And therefore, they, they, they don't know nothing. So I'm, I have to teach these people a good lesson. Look at what they're doing. Don't worry about what they're doing because we are going to lose our own hajj then. Remember what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said about khutbah? That if you come for Jummah and you're sitting in the khutbah, someone else is talking and you ask that person to be quiet, you lost your khutbah. You lost your Jummah. The reward of the Jummah is gone. Same thing. Any argument over there during hajj, it will make the person lose the whole reward of that. And this hajj will not be hajj mabrur, the accepted hajj. So we don't want to make that mistake. It is a little difficult to control, but try to always remember it and tell people around you to remind you in case you're getting into that situation. But it's the person's determination that, say, you are in that situation and someone next to you reminds you, right away we need to then just come back. Otherwise, no, no, no. But you don't see what he has done? Then, of course, there is no reason, no, no benefit of people reminding us because the person really have determined he doesn't want to get anything out of this hajj. When you're leaving your home, make the dua for leaving the house. Make the dua when you're riding the car. And then make the dua of the journey. And you will have all of these duas in the books of Adiyah that normally you can find anywhere. If not, let me know, inshallah. We will try to find you one. During this journey, I have noticed one thing, that there are people who really don't take care of their prayers. Fara'it. Because a long journey, people are sleeping, they're ashamed to perform salah in the plane, they're ashamed to perform salah. And whereas, it really, it will be the easiest in this journey because the whole plane is only our people. It's only people who have to pray, and they're ashamed of each other to pray. <laughs> and at the airports, everywhere, even if when there are non-Muslims watching, so what? I mean, it's ibadah, it's ibadah, it's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked me to do it and I'm doing it for Allah, not for anyone, not to make people happy. So people miss their fara'id, their salah, because of this hajj. Of course, for a salah is more important of ibadah than the hajj because hajj is the fifth of the pillars and salah comes at the very beginning, right after shahada. The first thing is salah. The second thing that I have noticed is people really they waste a lot of time during the journey because a long journey from here to there and then a lot of waiting periods in between. You arrived in Jeddah, then you are waiting at the airport for many hours. Then you come out of the airport, you are waiting for your bus. Then in the bus, you are, it's a long journey because there is a lot of traffic. People don't know what to do. And therefore, we are looking for something to do which means talking to each other, stories, and especially in Mina Arafat, it's a long sitting time, because mainly the time is for ibadah, but people don't know what to do. So normally the discussion is, oh, this is my field of work, and this is what I do, and this is what I earn, and this is the type of house I have, and this is where I live, and uh, my son does this, and my daughter does this, and, and oh, 
the whole world there, I mean, it's only a waste of time. That's the time where we really should be making the best use of the time in reciting Quran and Kareem, Salah, Istighfar, sending blessings on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Tasbihat, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. Make the best use of your time. Inshallah, we'll keep on reminding you of it during the journey also. But it's very important that we make a good use of this time because we don't go very often. Even if a person will go every year, it's only once a year. And we know how much we go. So really, we need to make the best use of it, inshallah. And the worst thing that happens is when we are just wasting our time and especially talking, a lot of time now the conversation comes, oh yeah, then we have people who do this and the people, and backbiting now. As soon as we get into that, subhanallah, the whole reward, instead of earning reward, we are getting other people sin on our shoulders and sending them all the rewards. We can't afford to do this to ourselves. For those who are going to Makkah first, and I will take it in that regard as everyone is going to Makkah first, because then wearing ihram for Medina will be similar also. When you are in transit, if you are going to Makkah first, if you are, when you are in transit somewhere, you will be putting your ihram on over there, it will be the easiest to put the ihram on at that transit point, because then you don't have too long of a journey left. Because... Otherwise, you will be putting your ihram on in the plane, which is a little difficult for especially those who are not used to wearing the ihram. If you are used to wearing ihram, then it's easy to put the ihram on even in the plane. But for those who are not used to it, if you really, you, you will need to use the bathroom to put the ihram on, you can imagine as soon as they announce, they will have big lines and everyone wants to make wudu and all of that. So it's best that wherever we stop in the transit before we get to the next plane, then we put the ihram on over there. Take a shower if it's possible, and if not, then make a wudu. But even wudu is not fard, is better. Then perform two rakah salah, this is also not fard. Then after the salah, if your head is covered, for men, uncover your head, and now you will be making the intention. There are different types of hajj that people can perform. I will just be telling you one type of hajj, because that's the only type of hajj we all are going to do. We won't be doing another type of hajj there. So there is no reason that we confuse ourselves learning all different kinds of hajj. I will be just telling you one type of hajj and that is called hajj tamattu. Tamattu means you perform a umrah. In these days of hajj, you perform a umrah. Take your ihram out and then when the time is to go for hajj, you will put the ihram on again and you will go for hajj. So you will be putting ihram two, two times. One for umrah, the second for hajj. For Umrah, either from the plane or where you stopped at the transit, or if you're going to Medina first, then from Medina, you will be putting the ihram on to go to Makkah Mukarramah. So this will be only for Umrah. So now as you're ready, as you're putting the ihram, you put the clothing of ihram on, you perform the two rak'ah salah, after salah, if your head is covered, uncover your head, and make the intention of doing Umrah only, not Hajj, remember. Make the intention of doing Umrah only. And after the intention, recite Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, Labbaik la sharika laka Labbaik, Inna alhamda wa na'mata laka wal mulk, la sharika lak. After reciting it once, your haram have started. But it's best to say it three times at this time. So after you said it once, and or you said it three times, it's sunnah to say it three times, now your haram have started. The best ibadah for you now, to keep on reciting labbaik as much as possible. This is your best ibadah now. Keep on reciting labbaik. Don't be ashamed of reciting it. Everyone has to do the same ibadah now. Reciting labbaik as much as possible. After you studied your haram for men, we cannot wear any regular clothing. For, uh, we cannot wear any slippers that will be covering our whole foot. We cannot wear socks. We cannot... Men and women, anyone, we cannot have, apply perfume. We cannot touch anything that is perfumed, soap, toothpaste, anything that is perfumed. You have to stay away from it, remember. And that is the main mistake that a lot of people make, that went to the bathroom, saw soap over there, used it. If you used it through a whole portion of a body, which means your hand or your face, any, that, any, any part of the body, and you covered the whole body with it, you have to pay them. So be careful not to use any of those things. If here you can find any type of soap that doesn't have any fragrance in it, it will be the best to take it from here. And normally, 
doors are available here. So it will be the best to keep one of those with you. You cannot cut any hair. You cannot cut your nails. Dealing with uh, wives, uh, of a dealing of a husband and wife, that is not allowed. Normal dealing of taking, giving things, even of touching is okay, but any type of dealing of husband and wife is not allowed. So, uh, and killing animals, which means normally hunting, and it goes beyond just hunting, and that is someone has some lysis in his head all of a sudden. And they're troubling you. You cannot kill them anymore. Everything has to be safe now, and everything is in peace. After this, you will be arriving Makkah Mukarramah. When you go to the hotel, put all of your stuff there and get yourself ready to go to the haram. Enter the haram. Again, remember at the time of going, entering the haram, you will be keeping uh, the, uh, uh, you'll, you'll save the name of the door and the number of the door. And then, of course, you will remember which, uh, which is your hotel and uh, normally hotels, our hotel will be, I mean, normally people go from this part of the world, hotels are just straight across the haram, so it's not that difficult to remember the direction to the hotel. Now, the first look you will have at the Kaaba is the time of the acceptance of dua. This is the time that you see the Kaaba. The first look you have on the Kaaba is the time when your dua is accepted. Make as much dua as you can at this point. This is a very important opportunity of your life. You will get few of these opportunities and this is one of the one most important opportunities that first look at the Kaaba. But remember one thing, as soon as you see the Kaaba, don't stand over there. It's very crowded. You can get pushed or you will be on people's way. Get on the side. And then start making the dua. Now you may not be able to see the Kaaba anymore because as you got on the side, but as, that food, as you have had the first look, just move aside and start making the dua. This is the time of the acceptance of the dua. After this dua, you will be heading towards the Kaaba. There is no Tahiyatul Masjid over there. Because the Tahiyyah over there, the way of greeting the Haram over there is Tawaf. So you will be going straight towards the Kaaba. And now we will be heading towards the Black Stone. Before you get to the Black Stone, for men, now we will be changing the position of the Ahram, and that is putting the Ahram in such a way that the Sheer will be going from under the right arm onto the left shoulder. It will be going from under the right arm onto the left shoulder. This is called ittiba' in Sharia. Ittiba' is sunnah for the tawaf. Not for every tawaf, but as I'm explaining here, for this tawaf we will be doing ittiba' and then for men, there is another thing that we will be doing, and that is called ramil. Ramil means walking like soldiers walk, with movements of the hands. So, first thing, we will, the person will do the tiba, put the sheet under the right arm, uh, uh, under the right arm, onto the left shoulder. Before you get to the black stone, there will be a line over there on the ground. That will tell you exactly the direction and the line on the black stone, that goes to the black stone. So before you get to that line, make the intention of this tawaf that you are doing for Umrah. And now you get to the black stone, pointing towards the black stone, Bismillahi Allahu Akbar, Walillahi Alhamd, and you will be kissing your hands. Now start walking, as you see everyone else is walking, it will be towards your right hand side, but you will see everyone walking in the same direction. There is no way you can make that mistake. As I said, now as men will be walking, it will be Ramil, which means walking like soldiers for three rounds. And after three rounds, the position of Ihram will stay the same, but it will be normal walking now. For sisters, there is no Ittiba, there is no Ramil. None of these things is there for them. You will be doing seven rounds of the Kaaba. Each time you get to the black stone, you will be doing this, which is called istilam, pointing your hands towards the black stone and kissing them, saying, Bismillahi Allahu Akbar. The corner before the black stone is called Rukn al-Yamani. It's towards Yemen. Yemen is on that direction. It's called Rukn al-Yamani. From that corner up to the black stone, 
you will be reciting Rabbana Atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al nar. This is the best dua to recite at that point. Rest of the places in the tawaf or rest of the tawaf make whatever dua you like. Many times people like to hold to their books and trying to read, and with that crowd, they're getting pushed and they're uh, trying to save their book, uh, they're trying to save their haram, and they get into a lot of difficulties. Is the best that you make dua in your own language, whatever comes to your heart. Normally, I tell people with me that think of seven most important things in your life. Make a list of seven most important things my iman, my children, my family, whatever that is. Make the list of seven things. Each round, make dua for one of these things. Until you get to the Rukn Yamani, and from there you will be saying, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al nar. It will be the best way of doing the tawaf because the dua is getting out of your heart now. During tawaf, don't look here and there. It's not good to look right and left during tawaf. Don't turn your chest towards the Kaaba. It's not allowed. If you did it, there is nothing that you have to do for it, but it's a major mistake that you made during tawaf. So, the thing, if you get pushed and you turn, that's fine. I mean, there is, we are not responsible for that, but don't intentionally turn towards it. After you have finished your tawaf, this last round, as you ended the seventh round, again you will be doing this tilam, Bismillah, Allah Akbar, Allah Alhamd, kissing your hand. Now you want to do two raka'ah salah for this tawaf. And for that you will be going towards Maqam Ibrahim. You will see Maqam Ibrahim over there. You can't miss it. So you will be walking towards Maqam Ibrahim anywhere in the back over there. And if you don't see any room on that direction, don't even worry about it. Anywhere. Anywhere in Haram you can perform or even out of the Haram. But anywhere you can perform those two rakahs. Perform the two, two rakahs of Tawaf. If you are around that area, then do istilam of the black stone once more. It's good to do it, it's not necessary to do it. That pointing towards it, Bismillah, Allah Akbar, kissing your hand, and now you will walk towards Safa. Everyone is walking in that direction to go towards, to do the sign. So we'll be going towards the Safa. When you go to Safa, it's a little hill, it's not too big. Get on it as much as possible. You don't have to go all the way on top. Now from there, you will be... Facing the Kaaba, it's possible to see the Kaaba, but if you are not at a location where you can see the Kaaba from there, don't worry about it. <coughs> Facing the Kaaba, raise your hand as you normally raise it in dua. Just raising the hand as we raise it in dua and make dua. This is the time of the acceptance of dua. So make dua at this point. After this dua, now you will start your round towards Marwa. From Safa, you are going to Marwa. In between, you will see two green lines, where if you have room, it's good to run between the two green lines. These, why these green lines, I'm skipping that part for every uh, thing that we're talking about, tawaf, why tawaf, why seven rounds, why istilam, I'm skipping all of that, because at this time, let's just learn how to do it. But here, since we, uh, it's something that uh, is unique, Hajra radiallahu anha, when she left Ismail alayhi salatu was salam, and she was running over there, she, she went over there looking for water, and this place between the two lines was very deep. So as she would get over there, she would not be able to see her son Ismail alayhi salam. So she used to run over there to get to a place where she's able to see. And this is to tell us that this is how big these mountains were. Now the mountains are very small, and we don't even feel like you're on a mountain over there. So this is how big the mountains were, and there, were, there was a valley between the two mountains of Safa and Marwa. So this is where she used to run to, set, to be able to get up on a hill in F, so that she can see her son Ismail alayhi salam laying down over there. From Safa you went to Marwa, that's one round. From Marwa you come back to Safa, this is second round, and keep on going. You will be doing seven rounds again. The best thing over here is dua, tasbihat, istighfar, sending blessings on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and whatever else type of adhkar, dhikr you want to do, that is the time for doing all of those. Now, remember one thing. You started with Safa, you will end at Marwa. One point that I forgot to mention earlier, when you in Makkah Mukarramah, when you go from your hotel 
for especially for Umrah, try to keep your shoes, your slippers in the hotel and walk barefoot. That will be the best thing for you to do. But if you cannot do it, then you will really have to take care of your shoes and your slippers. The thing is, after tawaf, you will be going towards Safa and Marwa. Say you left your slippers or your shoes over the side. After you finish your sa'i, you are in Marwa, which is a distance now to come back all the way here just to pick up your shoes. So, you have to really worry about them and take care of them if you take them. The best will be not to take them, just keep it at the hotel and just walk barefoot to the haram. But if you take it, then keep it with you until you save it, put it somewhere in, uh, in Marwa, at Marwa. Don't keep it somewhere in uh, the place of Safa or in the, the place of Tawaf, because it will be too long of a distance for you to come back then again in that crowd just to pick up your shoes. After you finish your Sa'i at Marwa, now one thing is left for this Haram to be out, and that is cutting the hair or shaving the head. For men, you can cut it short or shave it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made three times dua for those who would shave and once only for those who will cut it short. For sisters, they will be cutting their hair almost one inch from throughout the head. So, which means if the hair is long, then the, from the end of the hair, uh, you'll be cutting almost one inch of your hair. After you have cut your hair, or yeah, you have shaved your head, your haram is done. Although you are wearing those clothes of haram, the haram is over. Now, no more restrictions of haram, you are like a normal person, all the restrictions of haram that were on you, they are out, they are gone, and go back, take shower, change your clothes, do whatever you like to do. During this stay in Makkah Mukarramah, do as much tawaf as possible. This is your best ibadah now. Do as much tawaf as possible during your stay in Makkah Mukarramah, and during these tawaf, you will be doing always making dua and istighfar and tasbihat and reciting Qur'an al-Kareem. During your stay in, in Makkah and Medina, try to recite as much Qur'an as possible. That is the place where Qur'an used to reveal. It still has that barakah of that revelation of Qur'an for sure. So that is the place where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to be sitting there and Jibreel alayhi salam is coming with revelations every day. So it's a great place to recite Qur'an al-Kareem there. So use the maximum time in reciting Qur'an al-Kareem. Now, if you read the books, it will tell you on the 8th of Zul Hijjah, you are ready to go to Mina. Practically, is it, you will be leaving on the 7th of Zul Hijjah, not the 8th. On the 7th of Zul Hijjah, in the evening, you will be leaving from Mecca to Mina. So, in order to leave for Mina before that, you will put the Ihram for Hajj now. This is the second Ihram. You will be putting on the Ihram for Hajj. Perform, take a shower, perform two raka'a salah, make the intention that, Ya Allah, this is my haram for hajj. Make it easy for me. If this is not your first hajj, you have done hajj before, then it will be good to make the hajj on behalf of someone else. Ya Allah, this hajj is on behalf of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa on behalf of my father, on behalf of my mother. So, on behalf of anyone that would you, you would like to do the hajj for. But if this is your first don't make intention for doing it on behalf of anyone else. Ya Allah, this is my haram for my fourth hajj. Make it easy for me and accept this hajj for me. And now you will recite, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik three times. You will start your journey to uh, Mina. In Mina, all you have to do in these days, the dhikr and the tilawah. That's all we have to do. This is the first day. You went on the evening of the seventh, I'm talking practically. Books will tell you eight, because that is when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam left. But because of the crowd, normally people start going on the evening of the seventh. So on that time, we will, we will go there, have a little rest, do as much ibadah as possible, tilawa, tahajjud, and then in the daytime, that whole day will be spent in mina. That whole day will be spending in mina. The eighth, the eighth, the whole day will be spent in mina. In the morning of the ninth of the hajjah. We will be leaving from Mina to Arafat. You don't have to worry too much about it, because everyone will be doing the same, your whole group will be doing the same. So on the morning of the 9th of Zul Hajjah, you are leaving from Mina to Arafat, 
This is the most important part of your hajj now or of your life. Arafah is hajj. Arafah is the most important part of the hajj. And the most important part of the journey. So, now you're leaving for that. As we arrive in Arafat, the time of Arafat start from Zawal, which means the beginning time of Zuhr. That is when the time would start. If we arrive before that, you can have a little rest. Whenever you arrive, it will be good for men to take a quick shower if possible. And the method of shower over there will be that just take water in a bucket and throw it on your body. Not, we don't have to wash our body and it's not the purpose of it is not to clean. The purpose is only to fulfill that sunnah that Rasulullah threw water on his body. If not, make wudu. Then you will be doing Salatul Dhuhr over there. I'm talking practical. In books you will read a little different. I'm talking practically what anyone that we go from here, you will be doing there. So you will do Salatul Dhuhr in your tent. Some people like to go to the masjid. I'm sure most of us or people here won't go to the masjid. You get lost. All the tents look alike. All the streets look alike because only tents in Arafat. There are no buildings. There is nothing else. So it's only tents. So I recommend that even if someone tells you that let's go to the masjid, please be very careful. Let's go to the mountain somewhere over there. No, let's just stay wherever we are. The whole Arafat is the place of that ibadah. After Salat al-Zuhr, or if Salat al-Zuhr is getting delayed after Zawal, this is the time of Wukuf, which is, I said, the most important time of the Ibadah now. And the most important Ibadah of that time is Dua. And this continues up to Salat al-Maghrib, up to the time of Maghrib, up to the sunset. Although the time will continue. I'm only t- talking practical Hajj. So, we'll be there up to Ghurub. When the sun will set, then people will start leaving. Throughout this time, the most important ibadah, as I said, is dua. But after dua, then try to, if you don't know what more to say, then uh, recite some of the adhkar, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, do some istighfar, sending blessings on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa what can be better time for doing that, than that place over there, to remember Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa even at that place over there. So, these are the ibadahs that we should be doing over there. So you do Maghrib prayer, dear? No, no. I will tell you that. So, you perform, I mean, you keep on doing the dua and all of these ibadahs. One more recommendation, that because we will be in a group. So, doing ibadah, and especially when you are in a group, it becomes a little difficult. That you may be going, uh, able to go out of the tent, and you may want to do this, that go out of the tent, somewhere around the tent in the back, somewhere where you don't see anywhere that you know. And over there now, you can just put your head on the ground and pray to Allah, cry to Allah, and do whatever you can between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, after sunset, without doing Salatul Maghrib, everyone will leave for Muzdalifa. After doing Salatul Maghrib, everyone will leave for Muzdalifa. After sunset, without doing Salat al-Maghrib. Did I say without doing or with doing? Uh, yes, without doing Salat al-Maghrib. Sun have set, you will not do Salat al-Maghrib. We will do Salat al-Maghrib in Muzdalifa at the time of Isha. That's the time of Maghrib on that day to do it, to combine the Maghrib with Isha in Muzdalifa. We may have to wait a little bit in, in, uh, in Arafat before we get to Muzdalifa. So, don't worry about that. It's normal. You will wait over there until you get to Muzdalifa. Whenever you get to Muzdalifa, now in Muzdalifa you can have little rest if you like. This is the night of Ibadah again, night of Dua. In Muzdalifa will be spending only a night. So you are spending that night over there. What you have to do is first thing as we arrived, perform Salat al Maghrib and Isha. If you can, keep a small bottle of water. And keep it full when you're leaving Arafat because it's difficult to get uh, water in Muzdalifa. It's not because there is no water, but because there are long lines over there. If you have your own container of water, you can at least initially make the wudu and perform the prayers. And then you can go uh, to the bathroom and uh, you are not in a hurry to make the wudu anymore.
And now you'll be collecting the pebbles from there, small stones for stoning the shaitan. Seven stones for the first day. Twenty-one for the second day and twenty-one for the third day. Twenty-one and twenty-one, forty-two and seven, forty-nine. So collect about fifty pebbles over there because you will be there in, uh, you will need fifty at least or forty-nine. Then we will be leaving Muzdalifa. The time of leaving Muzdalifa is after you have done Salat al-Fajr and it gets light. When the light will spread before the sunrise, then you will start walking towards Muzdalifa. On your way, the sun is going to rise on your way and you will be walking to Mina. Now from Muzdalifa, you are going to Mina. In Mina, it will be a busy day for you that day. The first thing you have to do is stoning of the shaitan. Today it will be only one of them, seven stones. Bismillahi Allahu Akbar. And you will be stoning that shaitan. The time for stoning the shaitan starts after sunrise and goes, the sunnah time goes up to zawal. And it's allowed to do it up to ghurub, up to sunset. And it's makruh to do it delayed after sunset. What will be the good time for us? That will be together, inshallah. I will tell you then, over that time, we'll find out the best time over there, inshallah. Then, after you have done, this is called Rami, stoning the shaitan. After that, you want to slaughter the animal. Of course, we don't do it, we won't slaughter the animal ourselves. They have arrangement, the government have made some arrangement over there that you go buy and take it and they will tell you we will slaughter it by the time. I don't recommend that. So we'll make our own arrangement where we will have someone slaughtering the animal for us so we know for sure at what time it was slaughtered. So after that we can cut our hair. That will be the third thing we need to do now. After we have cut the hair, then our ihram is off. Now one more thing we need to do for today, or two more you may say, and that is tawaf and sa'i. So we'll go to Makkah Mukarramah now, perform a tawaf, do a sa'i after the tawaf, and then come back to Mina. And spend the night if Mina, in Mina, if you get in Mina during the night time, which most of the people of course, they don't. It's not that easy to get back on Mina, in, in Mina again during the night time. This is now, is the, you passed the 10th day of the Hajjah. You did all of these things on the 10th, and then it was the night of the 11th of the Hajjah. Next day now, which will be 11th of the Hajjah, and then following that 12th of the Hajjah, these two days, or if a person decides to stay for the 13th of the Hajjah, three days, it's optional, the third day is optional. The only thing that you physically see people doing and Sharia requires us to do is stoning the shaitan. The time for that starts just after Zawal. As soon as the sun goes towards the Zawal, which means the time of Zor would start, that's the time when the time would start. It goes all the way, the Mustahab time, the Masnoon time goes all the way up to sunset. And after that, the time is allowed until next morning, before the time of Fajr will start. Many times people make mistakes of not knowing the right timings for stoning the shaitan. Every year when we get the news of so many people dying, normally it's over there at the Jamarat where you stone the shaitan. Normally death occurs over that place. And normally same time. Same time. And that is on the on the uh, tenth of Zul Hajjah in the morning, early in the morning, because people from Muzdalifa, all of them, they go back, and as they arrive over there, everyone wants to do the rummy because after that they're going to slaughter the animal. After that, they want to shave their head. After that, they want to go for tawaf and sign. So they're in hurry to do it. Practically, I'll tell you, every year that I want, I take. <laughs> Our friends, 
and we go to our tent. As everyone is doing the Rumi, we are sleeping there. And by the time they do the Rumi and come back, then we wake up. They make a lot of noise to wake us up. We wake up, and then we see the right time and go for Rumi. This is the tent. And on the 12th of Zulhijjah, just after Zawal is the time when you hear about death. Because on the 12th of Zulhijjah, people want to leave now. Hajj is over. This is the last thing I need to do. So my Hajj is over. Let me just go and do the Rami and I run back. So that is the time rest after Zawal when you hear those type of unfortunate news and uh, information that you get that. that. These are the normal time that happens. These things happen every year. And may God forbid, but again you will hear it at the same time for some reason, and still people want to rush to it. And there are people. I mean, there are people, you tell them. I mean, people with us, I remember, I mean, not from here. I mean, other groups, you come to know them, you tell them, you know, please, this is the time when these things happen. So don't go at this time. Oh, no, no, it won't happen to me. SubhanAllah, you know, how, how much confidence can we have, and especially, especially when you're going to shaitan, I don't know. <laughs> People sacrifice their lives over there by the shaitan. After this, 12th of Zulhijjah or 13th, if you stayed for the 13th, all these are kind of hajj are over. Now you have to do one more thing before you leave Mecca, and that is one tawaf, which is called tawaf al wida the tawaf of saying goodbye to Makkah Mukarramah. Once you have done the tawaf, everything that you were supposed to do is done now. So this is the and show the complete method of Hajj is really not difficult, insha'Allah. And remember, really, it's easy as long as, number one, you keep yourself under control. You don't lose temper. You don't get emotional. This is very important. As long as we can control ourselves, insha'Allah, everything. Number two, we stay where we are supposed to stay. Don't get uh, impatient and run here and there. Oh, let me just run there and find out. Let me go to the other place. Or I'm coming back in 10 minutes. That's when normally people really get into a lot of hardships when they start running back and forth and running here and there. And number three, when you stick only with your group, don't try to say, oh, those people are leaving. Let me, why, sh- why shouldn't we leave? And let's leave. And then you see all of a sudden 10 people went over there, 10, 15 people went down the other direction because they saw people leaving there, people leaving there. Your bus is not there, so you can't leave. You just go over there, watch those people. By that time, your bus may have been gone. So these few things, if we just keep in mind, because rest of the things everyone is doing together. So if these few things we keep in mind, inshallah, everything will become very easy over there. And as I said, I skipped really all the adab, all the wisdoms, all the thing that deal with the spiritual part of this journey. I just told you the main, the main method of performing this Hajj and Umrah. And inshallah, with this, we will keep on learning more and more as we go. But uh, if we follow these things, these are the very simple method of performing Hajj and Umrah. On Umrah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for everyone who is going. And for those who are not going, make it easy for them to go and accept everyone's hajj. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ونساء المسلمين والمسلمات وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين.